I'm delighted to welcome you here to Belfast Harbour office this afternoon. You're in for a real treat. We've got some great speakers. And I'd like to introduce our Chief Executive, Joe O'Neill. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of everyone in Belfast Harbour, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you to the Harbour office for this afternoon's spring lunch for the Ireland-US Council. We in Belfast Harbour have a very long-standing, valuable and cherished relationship with the Ireland-US Council. And we're absolutely delighted to host this afternoon's lunch and to welcome and see so many friends and colleagues from the Council, not just here in Northern Ireland, but the Republic of Ireland and, of course, in America. A busy agenda this afternoon, so I'm going to be brief and to help with that brevity. I hope some of you caught a little bit of a glimpse of the video that we were playing um, in the background, intended to save a thousand of my words this afternoon. But to just give you a little bit of a snippet and an insight to the wide range of activities that we have here in Belfast Harbour, and the development plans uh, that we have. And for those of you who haven't been here recently, it is a rapidly changing estate and a rapidly changing area of Belfast Harbour. We in Belfast Harbour have invested £250 million in the last 10 years here, and we have ambitious plans for a similar quantum of investment over the next five years. And when you look at that investment that's been made and is intended to be made, so much of it is strengthening and enhancing the relationship between Ireland and the US, particularly at the corporate trading level. We are, of course, a port at our heart, so we are the gateway for imports and exports between Ireland and the US marketplace. But if we just focus on five initiatives here in the Harbour Estate to amplify and give an example of the level of transactions we're doing and the level that we are operating at in terms of our relationships with significant American entities, and we, we very much value those relationships. I've been a big week in Belfast. You'd need to be living under a stone in Belfast not to realise what was happening this week with regard to the build-up for the airing of the final series, the eighth series of Game of Thrones. For those of you again living under stone, you may not know so much of that is produced here in the Belfast Harbour Estate, and we have an excellent relationship and a hugely valuable relationship with HBO. Not far away from that, another significant US entity in another one of our Belfast Harbour studios, Warner Brothers, who's producing series two of Krypton, another valuable relationship for Belfast Harbour and for the city and for the region. If you look immediately outside the Harbour office, again, if you haven't been in here for years, you'll see a transformed skyline. That's our City Keys investment, £275 million, hoping to create and welcome 11,000 jobs, principally foreign direct investment jobs targeted at US entities. We're off to a great record, so it's a great start there. We are welcoming companies like Baker and McKenzie, just across the way. We have City as well here within the Harbour Estate. And finally, uh, as part of our City Keys development, you'll, some of you I think are actually staying it. We have developed and we own and manage a new hotel, the Marriott Hotel, so clearly we are welcoming the Marriott brand here. So Belfast Harbour Estate is home to very significant US entities, and we hope that through our investment plans and events like this here this afternoon, we can further develop and enhance those um, relationships. So that's it for me. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Again, we're delighted to welcome everyone here. And could I now ask and welcome Dr. Michael Summers, the president of the Ireland-US Council chapter here in Ireland. Well, Joe, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was very interesting. When you were talking about the amount of money that you're spending on the harbour up here, 250, 275 uh, million, you'd want to see what you'd get for that in Dublin. <clears throat> you'd hardly get a ward in a hospital. <laughs> It's great to be here. Uh, these are magnificent premises, and it's very kind of the Belfast Harbour Commissioners to allow us to be here. And uh, Len O'Hagan, of course, has been a steadfast supporter of the Ireland US Council for years. I'd also like to thank Dr. David Dobbin, who's chairman, and Joe, of course, uh, for your generous welcome and your splendid hospitality in having us here today. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll hear from our first speaker shortly from the United States, and I want to acknowledge and welcome here today. He's a distinguished commentator in the United States, so please welcome Jason Riley, who's here with his wife Naomi, and you're both very welcome, and thank you indeed for coming along here today. Now, our speaker after the main course is one of Northern Ireland's most successful homegrown entrepreneurs who is the recipient of the Ireland-US Council's Coo Cullen Award in New York last year, the founder and chief executive of Randox Laboratories, Dr. Peter Fitzgerald. And Peter, you're also very welcome here. Thank you indeed for coming along. Uh, 
Uh, now, I also want to say that we value our excellent relationship with the United States Consulate here in Belfast, and it's a great, well, a great opportunity to welcome the Consul General uh, of the United States here, uh, and she's agreed to help us with some of the introductions. So please welcome our good friend, Elizabeth Trudeau, who's Consul General. Thank you indeed, Elizabeth, for coming along. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to draw your attention to the screen here where we acknowledge our charter members and sponsors and we greatly value their support. Uh, and without the sponsors, uh, many of the events would not be easily possible. Now, I often wonder about sponsors because, you know, most organisations have sponsors. And all I can say about sponsors is that um, if we didn't have sponsors, uh, the meal certainly wouldn't be any cheaper. <laughs> it might even be dearer. So uh, we're delighted to have these sponsors, and uh, could I thank, in addition to the Belfast Harbour Commissioners, thank our Lingus, uh, Invest Northern Ireland, uh, Dalradian Gold, I hope I'm spelling, pronouncing that right, because I thought it was Dalrea, but anyway, uh, and the law firm of ANL Goodbody for the support in making today possible. So um, this, by the way, I, I get a very detailed organisation chart here about what I'm supposed to do. Um, and I should thank David O'Sullivan for this, because David works very hard at this, as does, does uh, Roddy Feely, and, but for them, these sort of events wouldn't happen. So uh, thank you guys for organising all this. It's, it's, it's great. And, um, <laughs> it's all very carefully choreographed. So anyway, so to get our programme started, it's my pleasure to ask Steve Harper from Invest Northern Ireland to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland have been uh, a partner with the Ireland-US Council uh, for a long time, um, and we really value uh, the relationship that we have. We attend a lot of events in the States, and I know that our team there uh, get an awful lot of value out of it. Um, there is some good news. Over the past year, uh, Invest Northern Ireland supported companies have created over 11,000 jobs, uh, over 1,300 of those jobs coming from US owned companies. Um, so the US is indeed an incredibly important market for us. Uh, the US is our largest source of foreign direct investment with almost 50% of the jobs created here by new investors coming by way of, of US companies. Uh, just over the course of the last year from Silicon Valley we have had a company called Signified and Imperva. Uh, from Massachusetts we have had Smashfly and Bamboo Rose and from New York we have had the technology company Slice create and commit to open new companies here in Northern Ireland. Uh, between them, contributing over 500 brand new jobs in this year alone. Um, and so the US corporations that we have here in Northern Ireland really recognise the talent of our people. It is the biggest thing that draws them here to Northern Ireland. Um, and obviously the, the, the great value that uh, Michael was alluding to compared to some of our other closer locations. Um, but it's not just in terms of foreign direct investment that things are good. In terms of trade, our exports have increased by over a billion dollars over the course of the last year, with 10% of that growth coming from the United States. So today it's my great pleasure to introduce the Consul General for the US here in Belfast. Elizabeth Kennedy Trudeau took up her position in September of 18. And the Consulate General here in Belfast has got a, a very interesting history. I hope I'm not stealing your speech, Elizabeth. Um, it was opened on the 27th of May in 1796 by the first American president, George Washington. And indeed, today it is the second longest ex uh, existing, continuously existing consulate general anywhere in the world. Ms. Trudeau's most recent role was uh, consul general in Lahore in Pakistan, and prior to that was uh, director of press operations at the Department of State in Washington. And she has previously served in Brussels, South Africa, Tunisia, and Kenya. Um, so please welcome to the stage uh, the United States Consul General and fantastic friend of Northern Ireland, Elizabeth Kennedy Trudeau. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I can really think of no better place to celebrate the deep ties between this island and the United States than this room which notes the historic background that we share, as well as the forward-looking endeavors that Belfast Harbor really exemplifies here in Northern Ireland. 
It's a special honor, though, to join you today to welcome one of your speakers to the US, or the Ireland US Council lunch. I'm honored to introduce a distinguished American journalist, political con commentator, and author who's a member of the editorial board of the United States' largest daily newspaper, The Wall Street Journal. He is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, frequently appears as a commentator on Fox News, as well as on ABC and C-SPAN. A NATO of Buffalo in upstate New York, which I think just finished snow probably this week. Um, he earned a bachelor's degree in English from the State University of New York at Buffalo. His first jobs in journalism were at the Buffalo News and USA Today, and then he joined the Wall Street Journal in 1994 as a copy reader on the National News Desk in New York. In April 1996, he was named to the newly created position of the editorial interactive editor and joined the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal in 2005. He's the author of three books. The first, Let Them In, A Case for Open Borders, which was published in 2008, which talks about a free market-based US immigration policy. Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, which was published in 2014 which discusses government efforts to help the black underclass. In his most recent book, published in 2017, False Black Power, an assessment of why black political success is not translated into more economic success. It is a high honor and a distinct pleasure to welcome a fellow American to the podium here today in Belfast, Jason Riley. Thank you for that, uh, that very kind introduction. Uh, I will tell you, it's good to know that the services of an American political commentator are still in demand these days after we got so much wrong back in 2016. Uh, so I appreciate your, your abiding faith in my, in my profession. <clears throat> when I first received the invitation to speak here today, I was concerned that someone at the Ireland U.S. Council had made a horrible mistake based on my last name. Um, I showed the email to my wife and said, this can't be right. Do they know I'm not Irish? Do they know just how not Irish I am? <laughs> but here we are, and I'm very, very grateful uh, to be here. I was asked to make a few remarks about what's going on politically in America. And I assured the council that I could do that. But in all honesty, no one knows what is going on uh, politically in America. We are in uncharted territory. The election of Donald Trump shocked everyone, including Donald Trump. Um, and many people have spent a very long time studying US politics. I myself have been a journalist for 25 years now are still trying to figure out exactly what happened. Or rather, to be more specific, some of us are trying to figure out what happened, while others simply refuse to accept the results of the election. Uh, they blame Russian interference, they blame fake ads on social media, they blame voter suppression, they blame the FBI director, they blame white nationalists. And I'm not just talking about the Hillary Clinton supporters. I'm also speaking about my colleagues in the media, many of whom have seemed to morph into sort of democratic political activists. They now see their job as not simply to cover the White House, but to take down the Trump administration. And one reason that the president resorts to Twitter and social media so often is because he doesn't think that the, the media will give him a fair shot. He doesn't think they will cover him in a balanced way. So he uses social media to go around that mainstream media, around the press. Um, and it's hard to blame him. Uh, the, the, the US media has long leaned Democrat, but now they've dropped any, any pretense of being objective. Uh, they've joined the so-called political resistance to Donald Trump. And I say this as someone who myself was quite critical uh, of the president when he campaigned. I did not vote for him. I've continued to criticize him in my columns when I disagree with him on policy, as I do when it comes to things like immigration 
and trade, for example. But I also think it's important for the media to try and explain why more than 60 million people voted for him and have stood by him despite his well-known character flaws. And what's going on in America is that very few people in my profession have any interest in doing that. Uh, Trump surprised everyone in 2016 because he was so unconventional. And unconventional candidates historically have not been able to win the presidency. Trump had never held elected office, didn't raise a lot of money, didn't spend much money. He didn't have any endorsements. He was phenomenally undisciplined as a candidate. He had no get out the vote organization. He held rallies instead of knocking on doors like traditional politicians do. And on top of all that, the polls consistently said that voters viewed him as unpresidential. But he won anyway. He won because people were upset and wanted change. Not the people who read the New York Times and watch CNN and share the sensibilities of those institutions. Not the people who live in New York and California. I'm talking about the people who live in between, in Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan, Pennsylvania and Iowa. As one writer put it, Trump swept the areas of the country that keep our lights on and our motors turning. He seized on the widespread sense that American life was destined to get worse from generation to generation. Americans wanted opportunity for the next generation, not a managed decline of the country. People in the press, people like me, mostly missed that story because we were so focused on Trump's temperament. What mattered to most of the media were his character flaws. And it was inconceivable to us that millions of economically distressed working class voters in the nation's interior would have different priorities than we had. Throughout the campaign, around two-thirds of voters consistently told pollsters that the country was moving in the wrong direction. Trump represented change. And millions of Americans ultimately decided that they didn't have the luxury of obsessing over his personal shortcomings the way people like Jason Riley and other media elites were. These people were out of work. They hadn't had a raise in a decade. College was no longer affordable. Healthcare costs were supposed to go down, but they had been rising. These people said to themselves, Trump may be crude, he may be unpolished, but he also sounds like someone who can shake up Washington. I'll roll the dice on it. By contrast, a vote for Hillary Clinton was a vote for more of the same. And the status quo wasn't working for a lot of people in America. They had lost their faith in political institutions to act in their best interest. Trump tapped into that. He said he would take on the media elites, the political elites, the Republican elites. Trump didn't beat Clinton because of Russia interference or voter suppression or because sexism and bigotry is ascendant in America. He won because a lot of people, millions of people, who voted for Barack Obama in previous elections cast ballots for Trump this time. Trump also had the advantage of running against a deeply unpopular opponent in Hillary Clinton. It's important to keep in mind that voters had already rejected Hillary eight years earlier when she ran against Barack Obama. America was done with the Clintons, but Democrats decided to nominate her anyway in 2016. And she turned out to be a very bad candidate. She insulted Trump supporters and it turns out there were some 63 million of them. She called them deplorable. Now it's one thing to go after your opponent like that. It's another thing to extend that criticism to his supporters, which she did. Hillary also made the same mistake that the media did. She ignored the issues that Trump was highlighting and tried to make the campaign about his character flaws. And like the media, she learned that voters had other priorities. So, how has Trump done since he's been elected? Well, it's gonna depend on who you ask in America. I can assure you there's been absolutely no improvement in the president's character. <laughs> Trump remains as unpresidential as ever. 
he is in no danger of turning into a conventional politician. He seems to enjoy publicly humiliating people who work for him. He picks stupid, unwinnable fights. He makes gratuitously divisive comments. He says things that shouldn't be said by anyone, let alone the President of the United States. As my wife likes to put it, Trump has no filter. And of course, these are the aspects of the Trump administration that Democrats and the media continue to focus on. But the reality is that they are hardly the sum of his presidency so far. Trump promised to cut taxes, revive manufacturing, reduce regulations, lower unemployment, and appoint conservative judges. And he has largely kept those promises. The US economy under Trump is faring better by many measures than it has in a generation or longer. The previous administration said 2% annual economic growth was the best we can do, get used to it. They said it was the new normal. Trump has shown that the economy can sustain significantly faster growth. The pace of factory hiring has more than doubled since Trump was elected. Optimism among small business owners who employed nearly half of America's private sector workforce is at levels not seen since Ronald Reagan. Wages are up, home ownership is up, consumer spending is up, and the best feature of this economic growth is its inclusiveness. As many of you know from speaking to you, many people who have been to America know, it is a very large and incredibly diverse nation. And under Trump, we've seen simultaneous gains among voters of various demographic groups, which is something the, com the country has not experienced in a very long time, if ever. Older workers, younger workers, women, minorities, the less educated, all are faring better in the labor force today than they did under President Obama. The jobless rate for Americans aged 16 to 24 has hit a 50-year low in America. The black unemployment rate has fallen to its lowest number on record in America. People who had stopped looking for work are sending out resumes. Job turnover has increased. More people are quitting jobs because they're confident that a better one can be found. And this tighter labor market has forced employers to increase pay and benefits to either attract new workers or simply hold on to the ones that they have. Job openings have reached their highest level in nearly 20 years in America. Does this mean Trump will be reelected in 2020? I think it's much too early to tell. A lot could happen over the next 19 months. The economy could slip into recession. As I was saying to some gentlemen earlier this afternoon, growth in Europe and Asia has already slowed down. And of course, we live in a globalized economy, so the US is not immune to these trends. The president's trade war with China and other countries could escalate. Trump's obsession with building a wall along the Mexican border could get the better of him. And with the Democrats now controlling the House of Representatives, there will be non-stop investigations of this president between now and the next election. You also have to factor in that Democrats are extremely motivated. They had a very good midterm election last year. We saw turnout in some races that exceeded what you typically find in a presidential election year. But Democrats are very divided on what type of candidate to nominate to challenge Trump. Some think the country is looking for a left-wing Donald Trump, someone who will go insult for insult with the president. Some think the country wants a progressive liberal who will focus on raising taxes and redistributing wealth. And then you have candidates who think Democrats should nominate someone more moderate who can win back those working class Trump voters in the middle of the country who previously voted for Obama. My best guess 19 months out is that the country will stick with Trump, warts and all, if he continues to deliver economically. And if voters do decide to go with a Democrat in 2020, they'll want someone who can tone things down and bring the country together. Among other things, the Trump presidency has been exhausting. I, however, do not want to be exhausting, so I will stop here. Thank you.
Jason, that was great. Many thanks indeed. Are you taking bets on whether President Trump will be re-elected or not? I wasn't too sure. And would you welcome from Dalradian Gold, because I got it wrong first of all, uh, Brian Kelly, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. First, I want to say how honoured and pleased I am to have been asked to introduce our next speaker. I also want to say that Dalradian Gold is delighted to participate today in this Ireland-US Council event. Um, a few words just on the company. Dalradian, we have a proposed $1 billion investment to build an underground gold and silver mine in County Tyrone. Over the past 10 years, $400 million has already been invested to advance this transformative project. Some 1,000 jobs will be created for a 25-year life of mine. We are owned by Orion, a New York-based private equity firm whose investors are primarily pension funds uh, from across 11 US states. Once fully permitted, our mine will provide a major long-lasting boost to marginalized communities in the border region threatened with further economic isolation following Brexit. If we were looking for additional encouragement and inspiration in building a new sector for Northern Ireland, we would look no further than our next guest, Dr. Peter Fitzgerald, and what he has achieved. Dr. Fitzgerald is Chief Executive and Founder of Randox Laboratories, a fast-growing company that he has built from scratch right here in Northern Ireland. Last year, at the 56th annual dinner in New York, he was presented with the Ireland-US Council Cucullin Award, which is designed to mark significant achievement in building relations between Northern Ireland and America. Randox Laboratories is a global leader in the in vitro diagnostics industry. The company was established in a chicken shed at the back of his parents' home in Northern Ireland in 1982. It now manufactures more clinical diagnostic products than any other company in the world. Starting with a team of six employees and important support from Ireland's and Fest Northern Ireland's predecessor, the company now employs 1,600 workers around the world. Its main manufacturing and research and development sites are in Northern Ireland and across the border in County Donegal. It also operates sites in India and in Washington DC in the United States, with offices in 20 countries selling 2,000 discrete products around the world. The company invests heavily in research and development and has rapidly expanded its portfolio of reagents. As a biochemistry researcher at Queen's University Belfast in the 1980s, he decided that the only way to take his studies in the direction he wished was to set up a company. It has since grown into a major business and expects sales for this year will surpass some $400 million. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Peter Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't, I don't have much else to say now. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the Iron US Council for asking me to speak today. I'm really honored. And again, thanks very much for the sponsors. Now, Adam Smith of the Wealth of Nations fame, considered by many people to be the most eminent sort of famous philosopher, politician, economic thinker the world has ever known. He was Scottish, but he was greatly influenced by an Ulster Irishman, his teacher Francis Hutchison from Armagh at Glasgow University. His thoughts, his writings may have influenced the early American colonists, the many Presbyterian Catholics who left this part of the world to seek a better life in the young Americas. Smith, like many of our countrymen, disliked and objected to high taxes and restricted trading conditions, which helped trigger independence and eventually the extraordinary growth of the American economy. Overly, restrict, overly restricted practices, movements of people, closed trades, high taxes, and monopolies, I think, hinder wealth creation. Northern Ireland can only prosper when we have open markets and reasonably like government, although having some government would be useful. We still have a reasonably high public sector in Northern Ireland. 
We are, I believe, becoming more enterprising, but in my opinion, still room for improvement, still pocket of resistance to private enterprise. It is vital that we open our borders, allowing access to global talent and ideas. As a child, I was always looking towards America, as lots of people in Northern Ireland always have, following the American elections and amazing Kennedys more closely than the British. Strangely, I identified more with front American frontier heroes, such as Davy Crockett's land ones near home. In many respects, nothing has changed, maybe modified a bit. But not only 18th century philosophers have influenced America, many people from Ireland are still doing so. One of the great strengths of the America, America is that it allows the development of disrupting technologies and models, not necessarily originated in America. So this is why Randix, we're endeavouring to accelerate the development of the, our US market for our revolutionary products. Now, Randix is founded to create profits so that we could execute long-term medical research. We're just a medium-sized company of about 1,600 people, but we are growing robustly. We manufacture products to test the blood for biomarkers that help cl clinicians diagnose for disease conditions. For example, we manufacture about 10% of all cholesterol tests which are used in the world. So the profits from these sort of classical products, we reinvest in R&D. So in 1992, we started, we've, sorry, since 1992, we've invested about $430 million sorry, into R&D. So, because back in R&D, Ninety-two. We felt very frustrated that on examining clinicians' notes, they were very subjective. You know, some of fat, thin, drank, smoked, did blood tests, but did not specify the blood tests. So, and they only averaged about five or six tests per patient. Now, we felt this was totally inadequate to diagnose for any disease condition, considering in theory at least thirty thousand molecules could be met, should be measured in many ways, and there are many extrapolations of these molecules. Some people think it should be hundred thousand. So we started developing a technology that would enable vast numbers of blood tests to be executed at one time. So we put them on a microchip, eventually, which we call a biochip. It's been a long journey, many inventions, and over 200 patents. Now, we're still the only company in the world that has developed diagnostic biochips, which enable hundreds of tests to be executed simultaneously on the one blood sample. This enables a more accurate and timely diagnosis to be executed. This can save people's lives. So, this development and manufacture is executed in both parts of Ireland, Antrim and Donegal, and soon in the United States. Having developed the dis disruptive technology and many new biomarkers, we had a wall of resistance from clinicians, laboratories and health systems who did not want new information or they could not see how it could be used or be useful. But the overriding fundamental flaw in the reasoning is they're not putting the patient first. They are thinking of the institutional systems and orthodox clinical pathways. So there are two exceptions, forensic toxicology and agri-food companies. The public and private organisations, both these sectors, have been very rapid and early adopters. So we came across a classic Adam Smith situation of hindering improvements by restrictive practice in clinicians, laboratories and health systems. So we decided to go to the public and see if we could demonstrate the benefit to people by offering the most comprehensive and advanced blood test in the world. Could this improve people's lives, save their lives, and would they pay? The answer is resounding yes. We reckon currently we can save lives every week and regularly improve people's lives. This can range from earlier detection of cancer, hormonal imbalances, and nutritional imbalances, which can be rectified, changing people's lives. Some nutritional or hormonal imbalances can lead to neuro neurological conditions, even mental illness. But unfortunately, people don't get tests done, so millions of people are suffering or burdened with things they don't need to suffer from. This applies to people who can look and even feel really healthy. So at Randux, we are diligently trying to spread this message to test with our biotips and change your life. I'm personally iron deficient. No, I don't look healthy, but I'm iron deficient anyway. <laughs> so this direct to the consumer model is starting to work and we are in the process of simplification and extending the conditions which the actual medical conditions which can, we can identify. There's a long way to go here. So we're using a lot of algorithms and AI to uh, get better interpretations. In the last quarter of this year we expect to launch another system which will enable vastly superior, superior distribution of the technology. Now, I was highly honoured to receive last November the Cullen Award. As I said, New York, apparently Cullen, you know, is mythical also a hero. I believe in him, by the way. Guardian sent him to Scotland to train as a warrior. I went to, train, I went to Scotland to train as a biochemist. But the reasons were different now. He was very beautiful. Men worried he would steal their wives and ravage their daughters. 
This is not my problem. I went to Scotland. He had many lovers. I didn't. So he clearly didn't need a Rondex bad chip, certainly with regard to erectile dysfunction. <laughs> it was not a problem he had, apparently. Now, it's very curable, erectile dysfunction, in most cases. It's quite often sort of nutritional aspects to it, so it can be easily erectified. <laughs> his, his anger after battle was unquenchable. Unless a host of women, and I mean a host of women, that's amazing, were sent out naked to him. In New York, I was told it's breast of women, but uh, they're naked now. What a man. Apparently, um, the only way to take him down was for all these women to come out. Do you get it? But he may have needed our STI test because um, he certainly was very prolific. And if, it leads, if you don't get our STI test, then it can lead to infertility and it can also lead to erectile dysfunction. Simply, Irish people are considered to be fighters and disruptors. We at Randlex believe it is time to disrupt health and the capacity to absorb and adapt innovation in America is legendary. So we're going to West. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, difficult act to follow. Um, my name is Peter Stafford. I'm chair of the Belfast office of NL Goodbody and all island law firms. Look, it's my very pleasant task to thank Peter for his uh, insightful and interesting words uh, this afternoon. Very much appreciated. So we're, we're grateful for you taking the time to, uh, to share your thoughts. NL Goodbody is a long uh, time supporter of uh, the Ireland US Council here in Ireland, North and South. Um, and also in the United States since we op opened our first office there in 1979 as a commercial law firm. We work at the, at the co-face of that very deep and extensive uh, tapestry of economic relations that have been built up uh, between Ireland and the United States uh, over the years. Um, so it's a real honour for us to partner with the Ireland US Council today. I think a lot of you um, handed in business cards on the way in. Um, so it's my very pleasant duty to tell you that we have a, a draw for two tickets uh, for Aer Lingus flights uh, across the United States uh, today. Um, Aer Lingus has been a uh, steadfast supporter of this organisation for a long time. Uh, and here to tell you about the draw is Sarah Lee Fabi, business, uh, business Development Manager for Corporate Sales at Aer Lingus. So ladies and gentlemen, maybe you'd uh, welcome Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just going to begin by showing you a very short video.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of Aer Lingus. Aer Lingus is delighted to continue its long association with the Ireland US Council, which goes all the way back to the Council's first event held in New York in the fall of 1962. The year before, John F. F. Kennedy celebrated historic and most important visit to Ireland. Aer Lingus will launch their 14th gateway to North America this July with the launch of Minneapolis-St. Paul. Last year, we successfully launched Seattle and Philadelphia. In January, Aer Lingus unveiled a refreshed brand with an updated logo and new aircraft livery, reflecting the airline's position as a modern and contemporary brand that competes on an international stage. The new brand identity supports Aer Lingus', amb Aer Lingus ambition to be the leading value carrier across the North Atlantic. The refresh is part of the airline's ambitious growth plan, which was the Aer Lingus increase its North Atlantic fleet from 17 to 30 aircraft by 2023. Overall, Aer Lingus plans to grow its A330 fleet from 16 air, to 16 aircraft from 13 in 2017 and invest in 14 new A321 long-range NEOs to provide capacity for growth across the Atlantic and within Europe. Um, just by way of a closing word, can we get in a commercial plug? Uh, the Ireland US Council always welcomes uh, new members, you know, things either, either grow or uh, whatever. Anyway, the, the, I'm told the membership dues are quite modest, <laughs> it's all relative I suppose. And I know that Roddy Feely, whom many of you know, uh, who's the Ireland Executive Director in, in Ireland, he's always pleased to hear of new potential recruits. So any of you that feel like joining, uh, you're obviously extremely welcome and we'd be delighted to, to see you around. Uh, and indeed Roddy would be delighted to, to hear from you. He has an office in Dublin but of course you can contact him also on the internet. Um, again, many thanks indeed. Uh, to uh, the Belfast Harbour Commissioners for inviting us here today. It's been great and we've all enjoyed it and hopefully it won't be too long before we come up again to Belfast to enjoy your excellent hospitality. So again, uh, delighted to see you all here and thank you very much indeed for coming along. Thank you. Bye-bye.